Hi everyone, this is Dr. Nali. This is a first series of video that I'll be discussing concepts that are related to stoichiometry. In this first one, I'm going to be talking about atomic or isotopic mass, average mass, and molecular mass. So the first question that you need to ask, of course, is why do we need atomic mass? And there are a couple of important reasons. The first one is that atomic properties, um, which we know, gives rise to the property of the substances that we're interested in. Uh, all of these properties come from the type and number of subatomic particles that you have in the atom, meaning it depends on the number of protons, neutrons, and electrons that we have in the atom. Now, we can figure out how many protons, neutrons, and electrons we have in the atom if we know the atomic mass. So in other words, knowing atomic mass helps us basically figure out atomic properties and thereby figuring out the property of the substances. The second important thing that we uh, will be able to do once we know the atomic mass is we'll be able to count the number of atoms we have in a given sample. Remember that atoms are too small to see, so when we weigh a certain amount of material, for example, 10 grams of iron, for example, we're really interested in knowing how many iron atoms we have, but we can't count it uh, because it's too small. So we have to somehow use the atomic mass information to allow us to count or to determine the number of iron atoms we have in 10 grams uh, of iron. This method of determining the number of atoms uh, by weighing it is what we call counting by weighing. I'm going to illustrate this idea using this example right here. Uh, so you can see here there's a bunch of these hex nuts which are really small uh, in size and there's a lot of them so it's a bit cumbersome if you have to count each one of them. I don't know how many uh, I have in here but if I have to count each one of them it's gonna take me a while to do that. But there's an easier method to determine how many hex nuts I have here. And the way to do that is I would just put a bunch of them in a bowl and I weigh the total mass of hex nuts I have in here as uh, shown on the numbers on the balance. If I want to figure out how many uh, hex nuts I have in this bowl, the only thing I need to know is basically the mass of each of this nut, right? So if the mass shown here is a thousand grams and each of this nut weighs one gram, then that means I should have, I can figure out the number of hex nuts by taking the total mass, a thousand grams, divided by the mass of one nut, which is one gram, and that will tell me that I have a thousand hex nuts in the bowl. Okay, so that's really the same idea that we use to count atoms. We know that atoms are too small, we can't really count them, but we can weigh a certain uh, um, mass of the material, of iron for example, 10 grams. If we know the mass of each individual iron atom, dividing the total mass by the mass of each atom basically tells us how many atoms we have. So the previous slide obviously uh, told us that it's pretty important to figure out what the atomic mass is. So then the next question is experimentally how, we, how do we figure out the atomic mass? This is done through a method, uh, through an instrument that's called a mass spectrometer. And the way it works is uh, basically shown on this um, slide right here in a schematic. And we're just going to go through step by step the, the important parts of the mass spec. The first thing you do is you take your sample and you inject it into the mass spec. This is usually a fairly tiny amount uh, and it's given in a, in a small syringe. And once the sample goes into the mass spec, you're going to heat it up um, in order to evaporate or vaporize the sample. Okay, so the sample is going to become a gas. Once the sample becomes a gas, it passes through a little chamber here where the sample is being bombarded by a high power or high energy electron beam. And what that does is it basically takes out a couple of electrons from the sample, the atoms of the sample. So in other words, the, the, the sample goes from an atom to becoming a cation because some of its electrons have been removed uh, by this electron beam or ha have been knocked out basically by the electron beam. So once you have the sample in the form of a cation, then a part of the mass spec contains these two charge plates right here. And these are meant to attract the cations. So they're usually negatively charged. So they attract the cations because they're negatively charged and the cations are positively charged. As a result of this attraction, the cations accelerate. They increase their velocity or their speed and they pass through the two plates. Now in uh, electromagnetism uh, theory, 
if you uh, have charges that are moving at a certain speed, they generate a magnetic field. What happens is then in the mass spec, after, right after the, the, the part where the two plates are uh, accelerating the cations, there's a huge magnet right here, external magnet, that's put uh, surrounding that area. Because the cations now, which are moving around this area, have their own magnetic field, you basically have two magnets interacting with, with each other. And depending on the strength of the magnets, they're going to uh, bend the cations through the mass spec so that the cations here are going to be bent a certain amount as they go through this large ma magnet that's on the outside. Now the degree of bending that occurs for these cations would depend on two factors. I'm going to go to the next slide now to talk about the two factors that are important. One is the charge on the cation itself, okay? And the second factor is the mass. You can obviously understand that if the heavier the cation is, the harder it is for the magnet to bend its uh, direction of uh, motion, whereas the lighter the ion is, then the easier it is for the magnet to bend it. So if we pick ions with the same charge, basically the only thing that's going to affect the degree of bending is the mass, okay? So then at the end of the path here, you put a detector that would basically measure where the cation uh, hits the detector versus a central position. And as you can see here in this illustration, the really heavy cations, it doesn't move up by a whole lot. So it stays pretty much on its current path, the path that, was it, that it was uh, uh, going through originally. And then you have the really light cations and that gets bent the most in comparison to the heavier cations. So in the end, what you have, the information that you get out of mass spec is basically a series of relative masses. You know that some of the cations are lighter and some of the cations are heavier, and you can put some numbers in terms of how many times uh, lighter or how many times heavier the cation is. And that's really summarized in this slide right here. So if you, can, if you want to pause the video and write down this information, that's fine. So what do you get out of a mass spec? the result that you get is called a mass spectrum and it's shown on this slide. This is an example for the mass spectrum for neon, a uh, sample of neon which we inject through the mass spec. And it's showing basically three different things here. Uh, the x-axis shows the mass of the different isotopes that are present in neon. So in this case we can tell that there are certain peaks that are present. Those peaks correspond to different isotopes. So in this case, we know that there's isotope 20 in neon, there's isotope 21, and there's also isotope 22. 23, there's nothing there, so it's only three isotopes in neon. The next thing is the y-axis. What about these peaks? What are they representing? They represent the percent abundance or how much of that specific isotope you have in this sample of neon. So in, in, in an average sample of neon that you pick out and you inject into a mass spec, you'll find that 91% of the neons that you have in there has a mass of 20. Uh, tw about 0.3% has a mass of 21. And then about 8.8% has a mass of 22. You'll see that these numbers become important later when we try to determine the average mass of a neon sample. <coughs> Okay, so the next question is, we want to know now how our relative masses, remember that the mass spec gave us relative masses, how can those relative masses be converted to actual masses, okay? Because we don't want to, you know, the, the masses that you get out of your uh, mass spec gives you information like this. Isotope 1 is, let's say, 1.8 times heavier than isotope 2. Isotope 3 is 2.5 times lighter than isotope 2, okay? But it doesn't tell you exactly what is the mass of isotope 1, isotope 3, or isotope 2. So in order to convert, we really have to set a baseline. We have to set a reference number. The idea is the following. If I were to say, set the mass of isotope 2 to be, let's say, <coughs> a certain mass, like 1 gram or something, right? Then isotope 1, which is 1.8 times heavier, would then be 1.8 times 1 gram, which is 1.8 grams. So then now, of course, you have a mass for both isotope 2 and isotope 1, and you can also calculate it for isotope 3 as well. Of course, these isotopes are not uh, 
as heavy as one gram, they're a lot lighter. So in chemistry, we use this convention to determine the uh, mass of an isotope, and that's called the atomic mass unit. One atomic mass unit is defined as one twelfth the mass of a pure carbon-12 isotope. So the question is, why is it one twelfth? And the answer is because, if you remember that uh, a carbon-12 isotope means that it has six protons, okay, because carbon has six protons, and thereby it must have six neutrons, right, in order to get 12 uh, as the mass number. So we take one twelfth of that mass because protons and neutrons have the same mass, so it's sort of like having 12 of the same particle. So we take one twelfth of that number and we call that one atomic mass unit. You can then say that one atomic mass unit, or AMU, is the same as the mass of a proton or a neutron, which is this number right here, 1.67 times 10 to the minus 27 kilograms. So if you then have the, a mass of a carbon-12 isotope, right, if you actually have a carbon-12 isotope, then the mass would be 12 AMU, right, because the carbon-12 isotope would, be, would contain 12 of those particles, and each of those particles weighs 1 AMU, okay? So how do we use this information then to uh, figure out the masses of other isotopes that are measured with respect to carbon-12? Well, it's easy. Uh, if you have carbon-13, for example, right, and you do an, a mass spec experiment, let's say you find that carbon-13 is heavier by a factor of this number, right, this long number right here, which is 1.08. 36129. If you want to know what the mass of carbon-13 is, you just need to say, well, it's this much heavier than carbon-12, which means that carbon-12 has a ma mass of 12 AMU, so carbon-13 must be 12 times this number, which is 13.003355 AMU. Usually what we do is we just round this number off to 13 AMU for simplicity, so we'll just say it's a carbon-13 isotope, as opposed to saying it's a carbon-13.003355 isotope. Okay, so in the next video I'm going to talk about um, average masses and how to do some calculations with average masses given atomic masses uh, as well as percent abundance.